begins today with a stampede in northern India during a religious gathering. More than 100 people are said to have been killed. The victims, more than 20 of them are women, are, are still being identified. The crowd had gathered for an event to celebrate the Hindu deity Shiva in Mulagali village. Some videos posted online show the injured being taken to hospitals and pickup trucks, tuk-tuks and even motorbikes. It's not the first time India has recorded such a disaster. Back in 2018, around 60 people were killed after a train rammed into a crowd watching celebrations for Dushara, a Hindu festival. Before that, in 2013, a stampede at a Hindu festival in the central state of Madhya Pradesh killed 115 people. Still in India, the flood-hit state of Assam is on high alert as it braces for more rains in the coming days. As it has been inundated by flood waters for several days now, affecting more than 600,000 people and killing at least 34. Chief Minister Himanta Biswa Sarma has said the next few days could be critical as India's weather department has predicted more rainfall in some districts. Assam experiences large-scale destruction to life and property every monsoon due to flooding in its vast network of rivers. On Monday, the Assam Disaster Management Authority reported that all the rivers flowing through the state had crossed the danger mark at several places and that at least 19 of the state's 35 districts had been affected by the floods. On the back in 2022, 4 million people were displaced by floods in Assam and at least 45 people were killed. Let's switch over now to China, where the city of Yongyang in Hunan province has been submerged in water due to massive floods. Streets, cars and buildings were inundated by floods following heavy rains on Monday. The Milwa River exceeded its critical marks as a result. A red flood warning alert has been issued. Meteorologists have warned also that heavy rains would continue for the rest of the day. As of April 2024, China had experienced the worst rains and flooding in 10 years, affecting over 5.4 million people, according to the media. Last month, dozens of people were killed as rivers burst their banks and exceeded warning levels. And in Europe, torrential rains, flooding and mudslides reportedly devastated buildings and trapped thousands in northern Italy, city of Cogn, on Saturday. Rescue services worked for hours evacuating those trapped. One of the evacuees said it had rained all of Friday and all night long and cars were swept away by water. Authorities had to shift some roads, uh, shot some roads in Cogne and several of the city's electricity grids and telephone communications were temporarily interrupted during the rainfall. Checking in on Hurricane Beryl in the Caribbean, it's set to now be a Category 5 storm, meaning its winds and storm surges could prove catastrophic. A storm made landfall on Monday on Cariacu, or an island which is part of Grenada. Two people are said to have died as a result of the storm, one in Grenada and one in San Vison. The U.S. National Hurricane Center said Cariacu had taken a direct hit from Hurricane Beryl's extremely dangerous eye wall, a ring of thunderstorms which produces heavy rain and particularly strong winds. Communications with Cariacu and the nearby island of Petite Martinique are still disrupted. Joining me now is editor of R Today, an online news platform in Kingston, Jamaica, Gavin Riley. Gavin, thanks for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. Hurricane Beryl is set to be heading towards your country. What are preparations on the ground in anticipation of the storm? Okay, so yes, you are correct. Hurricane Beryl is on its way to us right now. Um, it is a Category 5 hurricane at the moment. And um, in terms of preparations, the government has announced that we will be activating the, excuse me, the Disaster Risk Management Act, which is um, a preventative measure we enacted during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Um, there are also the local police, the local soldiers, and as well the fire brigade who are on standby at the moment. Hey. And thanks for explaining that, Gavin. Uh, when does Hurricane Beryl make landfall in Jamaica? Well, the thing is, in terms of the projections by the National Hurricane Center, which is essentially the analytics that we're going with at the moment, uh, Beryl, does, Beryl doesn't actually make landfall directly. Um, it is projected to pass just south of the island. And at the moment, um, we are supposed to start feeling the effects of the hurricane around early Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning, that's still just a few hours away, and it's already uh, caused havoc, wreaked havoc, beg your pardon, in Grenada, which is still reeling from the storm, also in San Vicente. Um, I'm just wondering how much damage is expected in Jamaica. I understand that people are making preparations uh, for this, uh, gathering up on water, on food, uh, backing up electricity supplies and so on. But how much damage is expected, though, uh, when the hurricane makes a landing? Well, the thing with damage is it's really incumbent on how close the hurricane comes to us. And at the moment, in terms of the projections, if it stays south, then we pretty much avoid a lot of the impact or the negative, the most negative impacts, which would be strong winds, strong winds and high storm surge. Uh, the problem with that is they don't know specifically how close the storm is going to come to the island. So what happens now is a lot of guesswork in terms of the potential damage. At category five, the damage is supposed to, well, it's forecasted to be catastrophic. Um, we might see something close to what happened in Kariaku earlier yesterday or not. It, it really depends on how close the storm comes to us. Well, here's hoping the storm doesn't get too close and cause a lot of damage. But I'm just imagining that emergency services should be on standby just in case. Right, Galvin? Yeah. Um, the Jamaica Constabulary Force, which is our local police, the Jamaica Defense Force, our local army, the Jamaica Fire Brigade, and all emergency shelters have been activated. Um, so, yeah, pretty much everything is in place. Has there been any forecast for any more hurricanes coming for the rest of the year? I assume we're entered into a hurricane season across the world. Right. Um, well, in terms of the potential impacts for more hurricanes, the Colorado State University, in their forecast for the region, they estimated around seven major hurricanes this year. Um, the problem with that, though, is usually hurricanes don't really start getting this intense this early and that's really the problem so it might be more it might be less but as it is now um it's not it's not the best start for the region well hopefully there's not a lot of damage thanks again gavin for keeping us updated Thank on this so A different kind of disaster has been experienced in Athens, Greece, where at least one person has been reported dead, while residents near Stamata, northeast of the capital, were evacuated by local authorities as fierce wildfires spread across the area. Flames towered over the mountainous suburban regions, sending billowing smoke into the sky as fire engines and helicopters were mobilized to extinguish the blaze. Local media reported the two large fires broke out on Sunday on the outskirts of Athens in Karatea and Stamata, causing extensive damage to several houses and vehicles in the area. Authorities used fire engines and helicopters to battle the intense blaze. A 45-year-old man reportedly died of cardiac arrest after inhaling smoke. 
Media reports say the Greek authorities have issued urgent 112 alerts advising residents to remain vigilant, follow instructions and evacuate if necessary. Several homes have already been evacuated. The fires near Athens were reported to have been contained over the weekend, but the Greek fire service reported 52 new fires on Monday, posing a significant threat to citizens across the country. Let's switch gears now to the situation in Gaza, where the UN says 250,000 Palestinians have been forced to heed evacuation orders from the Israeli military. Many people have been fleeing areas in and around the second city of Khan Yunus on foot and by car. Health officials in Gaza say eight Palestinians have been killed and dozens more wounded during overnight Israeli strikes. Thousands of Palestinians have been forced to flee towns and villages to the east of Khan Yunus. The Israeli military reportedly mounted strikes overnight on Monday after issuing evacuation orders. 20 projectiles were said to have been fired on Monday. Meanwhile, mother, in Israel, mother of rescued hostage Noah Agamani has died following a long battle with brain cancer. She was aged 61. Liora Agamani's death was announced by Tel Aviv's Suraski Medical Center. She had spent her last days with her rescued daughter, who was saved last month by the IDF in Operation Arnon. Since her daughter's kidnapping, Liora continued advocating for her safe return and that of the other hostages. She did this while suffering from brain cancer, which is often accompanied by headaches, seizures, persistent nausea, drowsiness, as well as cognitive symptoms such as possible mental degradation and progressive weakness or paralysis on or at least one side of the body. Let's bring in the VOA's Ricky Rossin. She is in Tel Aviv. Ricky, great to see you as always. And I, I imagine that news about Noah Agamani's mother's death must have dampened the move, mood on various platforms that discuss hostages' release. Uh, generally in Israel, what are some of the messages and condolences making the rounds on some of these platforms? Ricky, you need to unmute. We really can't hear you. The view is Ricky Rosson joining us from Tel Aviv in Israel, bringing us updates about the situation, especially with Noah Agamani's mother, who's just died of brain cancer. She waited long enough uh, for her daughter to return uh, to Israel. She was rescued by the IDF in Operation Arnon, which took place in Gaza. Since her daughter's kidnapping, Liora continued advocating for her safe return and that of the other hostages. So this she did while suffering from brain cancer, which is often accompanied by headaches, seizures, persistent nausea and drowsiness, as well as cognitive symptoms such as possible mental degradation and progressive weakness or paralysis on at least one side of the body. Ricky, I'm hoping you can hear me. Let's talk about Noah Agamani's mother's death and how people in Israel are reacting to this, especially those who are on some of those platforms where hostage release has been discussed. Can you hear me now? Right, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, people are writing about the combination of joy at the release of Noah Agamani uh, just three weeks ago and her, um, uh, her, the success of reuniting her with her mother in her mother's dying days, and the despair represented uh, by the story because Leora, uh, Noah's mother, uh, her struggle with terminal brain cancer was a very poignant part of the story of, of all the hostage families. Uh, she wrote to both to President Biden and to the Chinese president, because she was a Chinese citizen who moved to Israel 30 years ago, to plead for her daughter's release from captivity in Gaza before her death from brain cancer, which occurred uh, yesterday. 
Uh, I myself interviewed her in January when she was still able to walk and talk, although with difficulty. And apparently she was in a semi-conscious state when Noah finally arrived at her bedside. And she opened her eyes uh, to see Noah and uh, to say goodbye. We're happy she was able to see her daughter live, you know, alive and well from Gaza before her passing. She said just long, long enough to see her and to spend time with her. What has Noah said about those precious moments spent with her mother? Uh, Noah Arkamani released a video to the public last week. Um, in which she said that her greatest worry while she was in uh, Hamas captivity was for her parents, who she knew were, were suffering through this uh, terminal illness. And she uh, finished the video by wishing that we all learn to love and not to hate strong words and really good advice there ricky there are still other hostages held in captivity in gaza all of them looking forward to being reunited with their families the prime minister was saying the other day that hamas was hindering negotiations for their release how so well signs are that uh, hamas leaders in gaza especially don't really feel that they gain uh, from a hostage deal at this point. They see that Israel is already facing um, intense external and internal uh, domestic pressures to end the war. And the army has even announced that most military operations will be over within about three weeks. So Hamas are focusing their efforts on getting the highest number of uh, Palestinian prisoners released from Israeli jails. Uh, especially those charged with um, much uh, blood on their hands, as the Israelis say. And so they're not in a rush. They are continuing to drag it out. Speaking about hostage release, about 50 Palestinians were released on Monday by Israel. Isn't there supposed to be some reciprocity here, um, probably a prisoner exchange? One would think so, with all the talk of... Uh, the hostage deal that has been going on for so many months. Go Israeli government officials are all blaming each other for this release, uh, especially the release of the director of Shifa Hospital, who was um, accused of keeping hostages inside the hospital and collaborating with uh, Hamas. Uh, supposedly, they had to release some prisoners to free up room in the Israeli prisoners and also the prison and also to comply with the demands of the Israeli Supreme Court, which uh, uh, about a month ago questioned the humanitarian conditions at some of the military detention centers, especially uh, one near Gaza called Sedei Teman. Well, thanks again, Riki, for bringing us up to speed and do stay safe in Israel. A U.S. President Joe Biden has criticized the Supreme Court's decision to grant former president and current Republican candidate Donald Trump partial immunity from criminal prosecution in Washington, D.C., saying it sets a dangerous precedent. He, however, says it's up to American citizens whether to vote for Trump now, knowing he will be even more emboldened to do whatever he pleases when he wants to do it. This nation was founded on the principle that there are no kings in America. Each, each of us is equal before the law. No one, no one is above the law, not even the President of the United States. But today's Supreme Court decision on presidential immunity, that fundamentally changed. For all, for all practical purposes, today's decision almost certainly means that there are virtually no limits on what a president can do. This is a fundamentally new principle, and it's a dangerous precedent. Nearly four years ago, my predecessor sent a violent mob to the U.S. Capitol to stop the peaceful transfer of power. We all saw it with our own eyes. We sat there and watched it happen that day. Attack on the police, the ransacking at the Capitol, a mob literally hunting down the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, 
gallows erected to hang the vice president, Mike Pence. I think it's fair to say it's one of the darkest days in the history of America. Now the man who sent that mob to the U.S. Capitol is facing potential criminal conviction for what happened that day. And the American people deserve to have an answer in the courts before the upcoming election. The public has a right to know the answer about what happened on January 6th before they are asked to vote again this year. The American people must decide whether Donald Trump's assault on our democracy on January 6th makes him unfit for public office in the highest office in the land. The American people must decide if Trump's embrace of violence to preserve his power is acceptable. Perhaps most importantly, the American people must decide if they want to entrust the president once again the presidency to Donald Trump, now knowing he'll be even more emboldened to do whatever he pleases whenever he wants to do it. It really was quite confusing for a lot of Americans, many of whom stepped out to the Supreme Court in Washington on Monday to express their confusion. I'm here to find out what's going on. When the ruling first came out, I was confused. I didn't realize it was unofficial acts which allow him no immunity. And so now it looks like they're going to kick the can down the road to a lower court, which won't happen until after the election. And if Trump gets reelected, God help us. We are in serious trouble. Um, we are here, part of a group called, uh, anyway, we're here uh, to bring awareness to the death penalty. My brother, Greg Wilhoit, spent five years on death row in Oklahoma, was almost executed for a crime he did not commit. And now Donald Trump is getting immunity for crimes he did commit. Well, I'm trying to get people to, to unite and realize we're all in the same boat, regardless of what's going on. And even though this decision is not what people think, uh, it just shows that the one thing that's lacking, not only in America, but the world, is accountability. You know, everybody kicked the responsibility back to somebody else. Nobody wants to make the hard decision. Meanwhile, the former president's lawyers have asked the former president's conviction for the former president's conviction in his hush money criminal case to be overturned and his sentencing this month delayed. A letter sent by Trump's lawyers to the New York judge presiding over the trial reportedly cites Monday's Supreme Court ruling that granted the former president immunity from prosecution for official actions he took while in office. Back in May, Trump was convicted on 34 counts of falsifying business records. He will be sentenced on July 11. His team points out that he signed off the records while president in 2017. But one lawyer suggested this was unlikely to be considered an official act. Just last year, Trump's lawyer similarly argued that the allegations in the case involved that were within the scope of his official presidential duties. It is rather confusing, isn't it? Let's hope our correspondent in Washington, Maria Bird, has the answers and can help us unbundle uh, the situation that we've we found ourselves, Maria. What exactly does a Supreme Court ruling mean? What this means at this time is that he is not necessarily going to have to face um, anything that would potentially take him off of the ballot. So he has immunity um, from any convictions. And so uh, this immunity allows him to be able to seek the highest office um, in the United States. Um, it allows him to be able to, if he wins the election, um, to be able to have that seat um, as the president of the United States. And so this immunity was very key um, for the progress of his reelection campaign um, for his potentially what will be a second term, having obviously a break between uh, his first term when President Biden is now uh, is the current president. So this is unprecedented. As we know, we've never seen this before. Um, we know that there have been a few justices that have spoken out um, and they were very much against uh, Katanji G. Br J. Brown um, is one of those Supreme Court justices that has spoken out about this ruling. Um, we know that the majority 
majority um, of the Supreme Court justices did vote in favor of his immunity, and there were about three um, that voted against it. And so this is going to definitely uh, be a turning point uh, for this election cycle, and specifically a turning point uh, for the former president's re-election. So do people think that because uh, President Trump uh, did elect some of the justices in the Supreme Courts that, you know, this ruling was made in favor of him, you know, as a result of the trial that he has just gone through and the many allegations that face him while he was in office? Well, as we've seen uh, and as we saw with the debate the other night, the former president um, does not seem to be phased by all that has occurred. He seems to be continuing um, on his campaign cycle and, and sees that there are ways in which he's going to be able to seek uh, re-election. And so that, I think, uh, shows us that he had very clear ideas as to what potentially could be um, ways in which he would get around uh, not being eligible uh, to run for office and to be the Republican candidate. Um, so so this immunity, if we look to see those justices, that's why uh, many people are, are often talk about the uh, appointment of Supreme Court, court justices so important because things like this come into play. We know that the former president had several individuals that he appointed to the bench. And so these individuals are obviously going to be in support um, of the former president, even though we know that this is supposed to be um, focused on the law, focused on the rule of law, um, and it's that third branch of government. But if you are appointed by former President Trump, it is highly likely that you voted in favor of his immunity. Now, his lawyers want uh, his conviction of the Hushmani trial to be overturned. How could the court interpret this? Well, um, the courts can interpret this in a way in which um, that this is, you know, this is what was expected. We knew uh, that after the conviction uh, that the lawyers would be coming forth to try to overturn that because obviously they want to ensure uh, that he has no potential barriers uh, to being able to be reelected. As we heard, some of the um, those who were outside protesting out front of the Supreme Court stated that now this is moving to the lower courts. And obviously the lower courts do have um, some ability to potentially take his name off of the ballot in those specific states. And so that is what uh, the reversal of the conviction will allow him to obviously then uh, have full and free potential to be able to seek uh, the, re -elect the election um, in this upcoming cycle. If I'm understanding what you're saying, Maria, it means that there are no obstacles now to President Trump running again for office. But then if the Hushmani trial is not being cleared uh, by the Supreme Court's ruling, then that means that, does that mean that after his tenure as president, he could face jail time? Well, you know, he could potentially face jail time before that because we're still, we're not yet in the, um, it does not begin until January of 2025 is, is when the next um, cycle will begin for the next president. Um, and so that's um, potentially, we would have to see what would be the case. So if he was, if there is sentencing that's done on July 11th, to your point, if it's not overturned and he is sentenced and there's some, whether it's jail time or some other sort of punishment uh, that is trickled down beyond just a payment, um, then we could be seeing some of that being served potentially uh, before um, he actually goes into office if he was re if he was elected. Uh, but it also could be that the judge, to your point, states that the actual sentencing and that does not begin until after four years. Now, this is all unprecedented. And so this is going to we're we'll all be watching together to see how this all plays out, because um, there there's just such a short window of time between that sentencing and when we're looking at um, having a new president in the White House. Yes, it's unprecedented, but a dangerous precedent, according to President Joe Biden. He believes that um, this immunity um, a ruling sort of like emboldens the former president. And we heard some of the respondents at the Supreme Court just before you came on. And they also expressed, you know, their fears about what the future could look like under President Trump again. Could you help us understand why Americans are you know, a bit cautious about this ruling? They're very cautious. I, I think we're, you know, it's very unfortunate. I remember we spoke when we had the attack on the Capitol 
about the U.S. being the center of democracy for the world. And so this is another example of where kind of the the father, the mother, the beginning, um, one of the models of democracy um, is showing challenge once again. And so um, I think that what we're seeing is that many people are a bit concerned. Um, many people saw what happened uh, during the previous administration. Um, we obviously know we were going through COVID. There's a lot of other challenges there. Um, people have very clear opinions about what's happening, uh, the war in Israel and Palestine, and very clear ideas of what uh, the former president would potentially do um, and how he would respond and where the U.S. would stand. So I think that the American people are really very concerned about what uh, we could see um, over the next four years. Um, and I think the concern not only sits within the former president, but it also sits within the current administration. Uh, they're both Democrats and Republicans um, on both parties that see concern. And so the U.S. really has um, quite a bit of work to do. And it's really going to depend on the American people to ensure that those elected officials understand uh, what the people are asking for and what they're seeking for the next presidential term. A long winding road to democracy in November. Thanks again, Maria. We're still in the United States and reactions still trailing last Thursday's presidential debate. Coming now from the president's uh, Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, he was speaking at the Brookings Institution in Washington on Monday. He said the president's leadership should be judged on his record and not just one night. When our country is not engaged, when we're not leading, then either one or two things. Either someone else is, and probably not in a way that advances our own interests and values, or maybe just as bad, no one is. And then you tend to have vacuums that are more likely to be filled by bad things before they're filled with good things. So there's a premium on our engagement and on our leadership. But the flip side is this. More than at any time since I've been doing this last 30 years, there's also a premium on finding new ways to cooperate, to collaborate, to communicate. Obviously, we had a global health crisis and a country that was quite literally paralyzed by COVID. We had an economic recession, the worst since the Great Depression. Uh, and not just here, of course, but globally. Um, we had alliances and partnerships that were deeply uh, damaged and frayed. Uh, we had China that was moving forward uh, in ways that uh, were not being effectively addressed. So this has been a clear trajectory for the last three and a half years. I don't actually see that, that changing, irrespective of the, the politics of the moment um, in Europe. We have very strong allies, very strong partners. We just came from Italy, where Italy has, been, has, has played a, a major and very effective role in continuing to, to strengthen the alliance. Um, I think you've heard affirmations from various political parties in, in Europe of their ongoing commitment to it, irrespective of where they're coming from. So I have confidence that uh, we'll continue to carry that forward. And the reason, again, for that is because it's manifestly in the interests of the people that all of us have to represent. I'm back now to our correspondent, Maria Bird, who recently caught up with the White House Housing and Urban Development General Counsel Damon Smith on a recent announcement by the White House on providing as much as $85 million in subsidies for new housing developments in the country. The two-part program is aimed at addressing issues that have so far prevented cities and builders from undertaking affordable housing projects. General Counsel Smith, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about the new initiatives around making housing more affordable um, in the U.S. for many Americans. Tell us what are the new initiatives in place to be able to ensure a lower cost of housing, especially during these tough economic times for many Americans? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, the Biden-Harris administration is leaving no stone unturned in the search for solu solutions to affordable housing crisis. And that's why we're so pleased to provide $85 million in pathways for removing obstacles to housing, better known as pro-housing for short, a first-of-its-kind grant that will help communities take innovative and important steps to address barriers, facilitate housing production, and reduce housing costs across the country. So when you talk about reducing housing costs, what does that really look like, especially for those in the minority community, people of color? Well, absolutely. The types of things that it, it talks about uh, include, for example, in the city of Montgomery, Alabama, 
They're using $3.5 million pro housing grant to begin addressing nearly 60 years of disinvestment in primarily residential community along a three mile stretch of the National Historic Selma to Montgomery Trail. Uh, in Washington, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments is using funds to uh, reform local land use policies and expand access to fair housing choice. And those are just among the many, many things that the uh, grant recipients are doing to make sure that they are removing barriers and addressing issues, filling gaps that have prevented them from developing affordable housing at a rate that they would like. And we know the American dream oftentimes talks about being able to own your own home. How are you ensuring that Black Americans are able to own a home in oftentimes communities and economic statuses that are a bit disadvantaged? Well, HUD does work on this every single day. Uh, we do that work through our FHA loans and through our mini programs to subsidize um, housing opportunities. But for the pro housing grant, for example, in Newark, New Jersey, they are implementing updates to their local land use regulations, but they're also using their $4 million in pro housing funds to expand their home ownership, uh, homeowner assistance program and their equitable investments in Newark communities program that facilitates the development and rehabilitation of homes. And quickly, before we let you go, what are some of the requirements that make someone eligible for these type of programs? So local governments, state governments, uh, metropolitan uh, planning organizations are all eligible for this. And we have another $100 million in funding uh, being released later this summer. So uh, in terms of a NOFO, so we're hoping that people will apply for that and uh, that we'll be able to um, provide additional funds. Uh, the communities that received it before are still eligible, but we also know that there was $13 for every dollar that we had in ideas that people had to make this work and remove barriers and create more affordable housing. So we're looking forward to the next round. General Councilman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thanks, Maria. Now, a judge in Florida has ordered the surprise release of graphic transcripts from the state's 2006 prosecution of pedophile Jeffrey Epstein, a probe that ended with the millionaire financier receiving a legal slap on the wrist. Epstein cut a deal in 2008 to avoid charges of sex trafficking and rape. He pleaded guilty to a lesser charge and was sentenced to 13 months in prison. The nearly 200 pages of documents contain details of Epstein's crimes, including first-hand accounts from victims and specifics about payoffs to underage victims. When prosecutors made that deal, they knew he had sexually assaulted teenage girls two years before, according to the transcripts. On Monday, Circuit Judge Luis Delgado ordered the 16-year-old document released, writing the details in the record will be outrageous to decent people referring to Epstein as the most infamous pedophile in American history. The judge added that the state's leniency in the case being the subject of much anger and has at times diminished the public's perception of the criminal justice system. We're in Kenya now where police have fired tear gas at the capital Nairobi and the coastal city of Mombasa to disperse anti-government protests. In both city centers, many businesses have remained closed. Demonstrators have also taken to the streets of other cities, including Kisumu. Human rights groups say since the protests against the controversial finance bill began two weeks ago, 39 people have been killed by security forces. President William Bhutto has since dropped the proposed tax increases, but the demonstrations have moved into calls for him to resign and anger over police brutality. Cars were seen burning amid chaotic scenes in Mombasa as protesters clashed with police. The crashes in Nairobi have forced magistrates to put off hearings at a court in the city, according to media reports. My colleague Laya Olarinde earlier spoke to Kenyan journalist uh, Sarah Sombati about the latest. Well, joining us now on the program to give a first-hand account is Kenyan journalist Cyrus Ombati from the capital, Nairobi. Hello, Cyrus. Thank you so much for your time on the program. Uh, you were at the protest ground today. Tell us how the demonstrations, uh, you know, went today. Well, thank you for having me show. Actually, as you put very clearly, the demonstration actually went on well uh, across the country, most, most parts of the country, Nairobi, Mombasa, Kisumu, Nakuru, uh, Eldoret, 
let's say uh, the league that more, more, more than uh, half of the country uh, counties and then but then uh, come the afternoon now uh, there have been like, cases of skirmishes here and there people have been injured like for now I'm from the national hospital here in Nairobi they are saying they have about 10 five people who have been injured today most of them were had gun 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 shot wounds so that shows that uh, the demos went uh, from good in the morning which was the morning there were kind of the, the, the Uh, we, we, people were demonstrating peacefully, then they were in the situation of some criminals in the afternoon. But even now, as we are speaking, in Nairobi City now is, uh, is in chaos, to, to say the little, because uh, they are going to have joined the, the protest, they are, they are looting, they are fighting, but the police are now fighting them, or rather pushing them out of the city center. Yeah, you've mentioned that, you know, 25 people have been injured according to the National Hospital. This just goes to say how dangerous the situation is. But what is the update with, you know, the protesters that were killed? Uh, we've had, you know, several of them that were killed and the accusations against the police uh, of uh, responding brutally to these protests. Yeah, because uh, that, that, that nine people have been died, who have been killed since uh, the protest started. And uh, so far, around five of them have been buried because they are Muslims. And the majority of them are, are yet to have a kind of a, a, a autopsy on their bodies. Uh, they have now more, more, more than 200 who are admitted in hospitals out of gun wounds and um, different types of uh, wounds. And so far, the, 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 the police, or the, there is an, an, an organization called internal policing of oversight of authority which is now investigating the whole issue because they say police used extra or the threats of powers or other force to, to, to quell the, the protesters. And that issue of investigating the shooting actually is affecting the police operations one way or the other because the police seem to be somehow withdrawing from uh, confronting this group who are looting or attacking people on the road. It's affecting the entire process or the entire the, the, efforts to quell the, the, the violence or protest whenever they are violent, which is now becoming chaotic all over there. I don't know whether that, that's a plan of the government or it's, a, it's playing to the hands of uh, the criminals or the, the organizers of the protest. Another problem is that there's no face on the, the organizers of the protest because the whole thing is being organized online. So when you find that somebody saying that tomorrow or on Thursday we need to come out and condemn the government, the, the, the kind of uh, response from the, 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 the masses is huge. That's why you're seeing it's all over the country. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, still on this subject of those who were unfortunately killed from these protests, uh, President Ruto recently held a media chat uh, with the media in the country, and he was questioned on uh, a particular 12-year-old that was killed, unfortunately. What is the government doing for, you know, this boy's family and even the family of other victims? Would there be any compensation whatsoever? You know, as we start, as we are, as we are speaking, there's a, there's a lot of confusion because there's no order. Uh, you can't say that uh, there's a government official who can approach this family to talk to them and tell them we're going to clear the bill. Uh, these are, some of the organizers of these uh, protests organize an online funding system whereby they collect almost 30 million Kenyan shillings, which they are sharing with the families. So far, the government has not come out to say that they are going to kind of clear the bills of those injured or killed. But then the interpreters that say that... Uh, the government will take uh, care of those bills and account and account will take account of those people killed uh, in the whole process. I, it's, it's a process in the in the, the making, so we have to wait and see what happens. But at this time, uh, we have not heard the family say that they have been approached by the government officials. Only that the people who have approached them are the organizers of this protest through the funds which they raise online through Kenyans and other people who raise the money. And finally, Cyrus, you know, these protests have also morphed into uh, calls for the resignation of the president. What has, uh, has President Ruto responded to this or is the opposition also speaking on this? These people are demanding for his resignation because they are, they are, they are, they are saying Ruto must go, which is no, which is, will make, create more problems in the country because as we stand, we don't have an electoral body. And uh, for a president to resign in such a situation is that uh, it may cause more problems. Thank you so much, uh, Cyrus Sombati, Kenyan journalist. Thank you uh, for your reporting.
politics now, this time in Iran, where presidential candidates reformist Masoud Pazekshian and conservative Saeed Jalili clashed over foreign policy during the first debate ahead of the runoff election in Tehran on Monday. Pazek Xian said the country needed to strengthen its ties both in the region and internationally, stating, we can live in a cage, close the door and have no relations with the world, but we will have a poor life. Anyway, if we want to progress in the world, the more we expand our ties, the better we can live. First, we start with our neighbors, then we go farther as much as we can. For his part, Jalili said that Tehran should expand its ties, claiming the country has limited its international relations with selected number of countries. The results from the first round of elections show that Pezak Xian received 42% of the vote, while Jalili Gana 39%. The second round is scheduled for July 5th. The third round of UN-led talks to explore engagements with Afghanistan ended on Monday without the Taliban making any reform pledges or winning concessions from the international community. A few international organizations and special envoys from Afghanistan, from nearly two dozen countries, met with Taliban officials in Doha over two days. Rosemary DiCarlo, UN Undersecretary General for Political and Peace Building Affairs, who presided over the event, says she hopes the engagement and discussions would move things forward in a way that the country becomes a more open and ex inclusive society. Afghanistan cannot return to the international fold or fully develop economically and socially if it is deprived of the contributions and potential of half its population. The concerns and views of Afghan women in civil society were front and center. For the United Nations, the meaningful inclusion of women in political and peace processes is a guiding principle. I'd like to emphasize that this meeting and this process of engagement does not mean normalization or recognition. My hope is that the constructive exchanges on the various issues over the last two days have moved us a little closer to resolving some of the problems that are having such a devastating impact on the Afghan people. Benyam Gourmet has made history as the first black African to win a Tour de France stage as Mark Cavendish was held up by a late crash on the run into Turin. In a reduced sprint finish, Eritrea's Gourmet powered to victory with Colombia's Fernando Gaviria and Belgium's Arnaud Delis in second and third. All the pre-race talk had been around whether Cavendish could claim a record 35th stage win, but a crash just over two kilometers from the line on the 230.8 kilometer route from Piacenza left many riders, including Mansman, out of position. At the finish, an emotional gourmet who won his first Grand Tour stage at the Giro d'Italia in 2022 explained that the win is important for him. I guess we'll hear more of that in sports news coming up in a few minutes. But as we end the program, a festival dedicated to the culture of the United Arab Emirates has held in the center of Moscow in Manazania Square. Festival goers immerse themselves in the traditions of the Middle Eastern country, taking part in master classes, sampling local cuisine, studying the latest Arabic fashion and making henna paintings on their skin. According to festival guests, the UAE Culture Days perfectly conveys the flavor of the Gulf state. Organized by the UAE Embassy in Russia in collaboration with the Moscow government, the quarter of festival runs from June 28th until July 2nd.
I guess any opportunity to enjoy different foods from different countries is always welcome. Thanks for watching The World Today. I'm Amarachi Ubani.